will run throughout the talk, I think, is the importance of definitions. And I think definitions are an often underappreciated aspect of the cryptographic enterprise. And I want to try to, uh, to emphasize just how large a role they have played in, um, in the rise of authenticated encryption. So the conventional view of symmetric cryptography um, is that it concerns two principal goals. The first is providing privacy, and the second is providing uh, authenticity. Each of these goals has its associated tools and definitions. Privacy is normally provided by symmetric encryption schemes and authenticity by message authentication codes. Each of these has its definitions. Authenticated encryption reconceptualizes the basic task of privacy. No longer is it just viewed as a way of providing privacy, but also authenticity is supposed to be assured. The origins of authenticated encryption are really folklore. Uh, you can find within the um, early 80s, for example, schemes which were clearly designed to try to deliver authenticated encryption. They usually did a terrible job of this. This is the mechanism in Kerberos version 4. It completely doesn't work, but uh, it, it persisted nonetheless. In fact, nothing of this form where you have a non-cryptographic checksum and do some kind of chaining mode will ever work. Maybe we just needed to add some more arrows or something. Here's a, uh, a different suggestion that appeared by uh, uh, Virgil Gligor and his student, and it completely doesn't work either. I, I, I think the, the, the ink wasn't dry on the proceedings before uh, Charanjit Jutla pointed out an attack on this one. My view is that by around the year 2000, there really was an enormous gap between the way theorists understood symmetric encryption and the way practitioners did. Well, theorists mostly ignored symmetric encryption at this time. You know, it, only, it had only first been defined in a, uh, a paper by, by co-authors and me in 1997, and we thought we understood what the problem was. And uh, I would say there was no significant interest in the theoretical computer science community in 2000, or just before. On the other hand, practical people were beginning to figure out that they had implicitly often assumed that encryption provided much more than privacy, but the tools that they were using, they were also figuring out, didn't provide any more than privacy. And this would routinely get them in trouble. My goal was to bridge this gap and to somehow bring to practice a theory that would actually address the, the need that uh, practitioners seemed implicitly to, uh, um, to have. And in order to do this, my author Mihir Bellari and I, and a separate and independent work by uh, Jonathan Katz and Modi Jung, defined what I'll call here probabilistic authenticated encryption. And all we did was to generalize the then existing notion of symmetric encryption um, from our earlier work. An encryption scheme would be understood as a probabilistic transform that took in the plain text M and the key and spat out the ciphertext. And decryption did the exact reverse process, except that it could also output this special symbol bottom to indicate that decryption failed, that the message that was just fed to the decryption algorithm should be regarded as inauthentic. If you've never seen a cryptographic uh, definition in the provable security tradition, you're about to. Our adversary, A, is confronted with the task of distinguishing one of two oracles. It's either placed in this left world or in this right-hand world. In the left world, we choose a key, K, at random, and then we encrypt whatever the adversary asks for using that key. It's a probabilistic encryption, remember? Fresh coins are to be chosen with each query. Alternatively, we might provide the adversary this bogus oracle, this fake oracle on the right. It takes the question M and ignores it. Well, almost. It attends to the length of that question, and it replaces the question with an equal number of random bits, and it encrypts them. That would be one way of doing this definition. It returns that encrypted value. The adversary's job is to guess, based on the input-output behavior of these oracles, if it's living in the left world or in the right one. And to this end, we then define a real number, the advantage the adversary is getting in the task of distinguishing these, just the difference in probabilities. 
in the practice-oriented provable security tradition that uh, uh, Mihir and I had been pushing for several years, defining an advantage notion like this is taken as the definition of security. You're done at this point. You don't need to introduce asymptotics, for example. This captures privacy. In order to capture authenticity, we give the adversary a different task. It has the oracle, the real oracle that we just spoke of, and now what it wants to do is to spit out a ciphertext C star, which will be deemed authentic. It doesn't decrypt to that bottom symbol, but instead to a string. And yet, the ciphertext was not returned as a result of some previous query. Such an event is called a forgery, and the adversary wins in this alternative game if it forges. An authenticated encryption scheme, in the sense I've just defined, is one for which for every reasonable adversary A, both of these numbers are small, meaning close to zero. I'm a big fan of definitions. And the obvious reason, the one that's most uh, uh, cited, is that definitions enable proofs. This should be really clear, and yet it's not unusual for people to jump in in papers and pretend to be proving something when it's really not clear with respect to which, what definitions they use. But definitions are actually really useful even when you're not doing any proofs, I'd like to maintain. One reason is that definitions enable really clear thinking and discourse. I think lots of our problems communicating in cryptography ultimately stem from the fact that we haven't very well defined that which we're talking about. Definitions actually enable attacks. A nice example in this domain is the dual counter mode that was proposed around 2001 by the NSA. The NSA claimed that they had been working for a year and a half on this authenticated encryption scheme. They weren't so out of it. They knew the same kinds of things that the academics were publishing at the time. And yet when I read this thing, I broke it on inspection yeah, in less than an hour. What is it that I had that the NSA didn't have? Well, I would answer that what I had was an understanding of what a definition for authenticated encryption was, and this made it really clear that this proposal didn't do the job that it should do. Finally, and perhaps a little surprisingly, the presence of definitions allows us to reach for schemes that are much more efficient than what you'll get in their absence. Perhaps the reason for this is that when you have a crystal clear understanding of what the goal is, you can cut out all of the stuff and complexity that isn't necessary for achieving that goal. Authenticated encryption could have just stayed a kind of uh, academic exercise were it not for the fact that there was a sudden and urgent need for a good solution to authenticated encryption at the time. So WEP, the 802.11 protocol for providing privacy, was kind of taking over. It was becoming very hot around 1999. And um, uh, within a year or two, Terrible problems in the design of WEP were discovered. Basically, the protocol didn't provide any of the privacy um, guarantees that it was supposed to be delivering. The fundamental reason for this probably was that there wasn't really a single cryptographer who had contributed to the protocol's design. After all of these attacks um, became publicized, WEP had to be replaced by something, and one particular individual um, Jesse Walker had been closely following my work and decided that he would substitute in a proper authenticated encryption scheme in place of the mode that WEP was using. In general, I would say it is the, the, um, the individuals on standards committees who pay attention to what's happening in the real world uh, and on the theory side that have been really crucial in getting authenticated encryption into practice, and you could say more broadly for making modern cryptographic ideas find their way into practice. But as it turned out, our definition for authenticated encryption wasn't yet ready for applications like 802.11. There were two problems in the original definition of authenticated encryption, and one of these, at least, I never would have realized without the interaction of, of the individuals on the standards committees that wanted to make this real. The first issue was that the random coins that had been assumed 
present for encryption really needed to be replaced, surfaced, by what I'm calling here a nonce. The nonce takes the place of an IV, or initialization vector, but the security expectations on the nonce are different and clear. All that we intend is that each time this box is used for a particular TK, that the nonce will be different. A counter is the canonical thing to use for the nonce. Moving the coins out effectively and replacing that assumption by something weaker, that it's only a nonce, allowed a kind of drop-in replacement for authenticated encryption in standards that didn't want to be generating internal coin tosses. In fact, the generation of random bits has been a persistent problem in cryptography, and almost any time that you can take the randomness out of an algorithm and minimize what's required of it, the better off you are. Secondly, and perhaps more strangely still, an additional argument had to be added into the encryption and the decryption scheme. We call it associated data. It takes the role of a header that might need to be authenticated as a message is transmitted across the network, but can't be encrypted. That header, for example, may contain routing information that's necessary for this packet to reach its destination. You want to make sure that it is authentic on receipt, but you must not encrypt it. The AE goal, then, should be providing privacy to M, authenticity to both M and A, under the assumption that the nonce is new with each message that you encrypt. And here now is how that goal is formalized. First, the syntax changes, as we've indicated. Formally, E becomes a function with this domain and that range. And a simple way of handling the syntax is to insist that this function be an injection for each K, N, and A. I like this approach to handling the syntax because it means formally you don't even have to define the decryption algorithm. The decryption algorithm is whatever it has to be in order to make encryption work. Okay, and that's what I'm doing here. In general, I would say that the syntax of the objects that you define is really important and again, often neglected aspect of the definitional enterprise. Before one jumps in and does a definition trying to define just what the adversary's goal is and when it is successful, you need to pin down the syntax of your object. And sometimes setting the syntax right somehow is highly determinate of the security notions that will follow. Here is the security notion. I'm going to give an all-in-one kind of definition. The adversary has presented now a pair of oracles. They're either the real oracles on the left that encrypt and decrypt whatever NAM or NAC the adversary asks, all with respect to a key K chosen at the beginning of the experiment. Or alternatively, the adversary is given this pair of oracles. In response to any encryption query, it returns a bunch of random bits. This is actually a stronger notion than what I was using before. How many random bits? However many is appropriate according to the length of the question, which we assume to be computable. In response to a decryption query, the oracle's behavior is even simpler. It just says no, it rejects. Now this pair of oracles would be trivial to distinguish from this pair of oracles by the simple attack of asking some NAM and getting C, and then decrypting C and getting back M. If you do that over here, or for an arbitrary C, in fact, you would have gotten back the bottom indicator. What we demand is that the adversary not do this. Okay, so we remove credit for the one offending behavior that we've identified. This is very common in definitions, that you um, carve out an exception for the behavior that springs effectively from the correctness condition itself. The AEAD notion of security, authenticated encryption with associated data, I'll sometimes omit these last two letters, speaks to the distinguishing advantage between this game and that one. Part of the popularity of authenticated encryption stems from this very nice paper that Bellari and Nam Prem Prey did just after the initial definition. They pointed out something that's 
I think quite clear if you've internalized the meaning of the definitions, which is that the natural way of making an authenticated encryption scheme has to be done with great care. In particular, if we're trying to glue together a message authentication code, we're going to assume that it has the properties of a pseudo-random function, that it behaves as though it were a random function. If you glue together a message authentication code with a privacy-only encryption scheme, one of these randomized schemes that achieves just the privacy notion, not the authenticity notion, well, if you glue them together in the right way, you're good, and in the wrong way, you're not. And these two are depicting bad ways of gluing together these tools, and the third way is, decrypt, is, is depicting the right way. I think it's become a kind of folklore notion at this point that encrypt then Mac is a good approach, while Mac then encrypt and encrypt and Mac are not good approaches. And yet I would also say that this understanding of the Bellari non prime prey result is really quite misleading. What, is, what are Bellari and non prime prey actually showing here? That if you take a probabilistic encryption scheme, which is not what I showed something about, right? but something that takes in like a random IV and achieves just something like that privacy notion we saw, and you combine it with a Mac, that only one of the three natural ways of doing this combination works. But that's not what we actually want to do. It's not what we want to do because we're not trying to create a probabilistic authentication encryption scheme. We're trying to create one of these AEAD schemes that wasn't even defined until after Bellari and non prime Prey's paper. Furthermore, assuming a probabilistic encryption scheme is a really bad starting point, especially if you're trying to make a cryptographic standard, since no such techniques are actually standardized. I think a more modern perspective is that we can make AEAD schemes in lots of ways, and that this is what we want to be doing. There's constructions that will make it from a block cipher. There's constructions that will make it from a tweakable block cipher or a permutation. And we can take all of these routes and construct a correct AEAD scheme. But there aren't three ways of gluing these things together either. So what is it that you'd want to be doing if you were describing a standard for how to combine a message authentication code and an encryption scheme? Well, first of all, the encryption scheme would need to um, uh, comport with with what standards are already providing, things like CBC encryption or counter mode encryption. These are objects that take in a random IV and assuming that IV is random, do a good job of achieving privacy. So it's this transformation. And then there aren't three possibilities. In fact, in the catalog of natural possibilities that uh, we described, um, Tom Shrimpton, um, uh, Chanatip Nam Prem Pre and I, there were 160 possibilities. Fortunately, not all of them are correct. It turns out that eight of those 160 <coughs> possibilities are demonstrably correct, and I'm, I'm writing them for you. Some of these schemes may be somehow better than others, but they're all kind of the fruit of generic composition viewed from a more modern perspective than Bellari and Nam Prem Pre had. Well, now that we have our AEAD definition, it's not hard to start creating schemes. And one can do this from a myriad of starting points. The generic composition one that I've just talked about, or by going back to conventional tools like a block cipher. Here we are going back to a block cipher in one of the, in perhaps the first scheme that became popular. This is the mode called CCM from Whiting, Housley, and Ferguson and it's what ultimately got used in Wi-Fi networks. And I'm not gonna talk you through it, but the privacy part is effectively um, done using counter mode. We're making a series of, of, of numbers, encrypting them and XORing that with this pad. And then the authenticity part is effectively done with the CBC Mac. So this looks something like encrypt and Mac which was one of the generic methods I told you doesn't generally work. But in this context, we can prove that it does work. And this was first shown by um, Johnson in 2002.
I'm abbreviating all of these theorems. I'm not going to teach you provable security if you haven't uh, seen it before. Each of these is shorthand for the presence of a reduction. In this case, what is the reduction doing? It's taking an adversary that attacks this high-level scheme in the AEAD sense, the thing that I, I've given you a definition of, and it's turning that adversary into a lower level one that breaks the security of your underlying primitive. In this case, your underlying primitive is the block cipher E on which uh, the CBC MAC and ECB implicitly depends. Here's another scheme. This one's called GCM. And this one uh, ultimately became more popular still than CCM. And I would say is the dominant mode at present for authenticated encryption. Now, the authentication part is done by this peculiar operation. This dot h means that we're multiplying by a value called h derived from the underlying key in the finite field with 2 to the 128 elements. So this is actually a polynomial evaluation. We're evaluating the polynomial at the point whose coefficients spell out the AD value, that associated data. We also continue to evaluate that polynomial for the ciphertext that we've gotten by counter mode encrypting the plain text. So this one looks very much like an encrypt then MAC solution, though it doesn't perfectly fall into that framework. For one thing, we're using uh, the same key for both halves. This mode is again provably secure, though with disappointingly weak bounds. A proposal that I had made and that evolved over many years is called OCB for offset codebook mode. Here I'm describing it in terms of a tweakable block cipher. A tweakable block cipher is like an ordinary block cipher, except for the presence of this tweak written upstairs. And what we want is that as you change this tweak, it's as though you were selecting a new and independent key with each different value. But rather than sticking it down where the key is, I'm putting it upstairs so that I can try to optimize the algorithms so that when there's good locality in the way tweaks are used, we're able to get the next image faster than if we were to be reeking the underlying block cipher. Okay? Tweakable block ciphers turn out to be just the right tool in order for you to conveniently develop authenticated encryption schemes from, well, from them. Yeah, if you start from a block cipher, somehow the gap between where you're heading, AEAD, and your starting point, the block cipher, is just a little bit too far for a human being to conveniently traverse. The tweakable block cipher makes a nice intermediate point. You can design the mode in terms of the tweakable block cipher, and then you can show how to achieve the tweakable block cipher efficiently. Here's the definition of a tweakable block cipher. I think I won't talk you through it very much like an ordinary block cipher, apart from having a family of T-indexed permutations instead of just one. And this particular mode was designed to be especially fast to minimize overhead over just <coughs> counter mode encryption. And we achieved that end. Nowadays, an implementation of OCB runs in about 0.63 cycles per byte on a modern Intel processor, essentially the exact same speed as counter mode would run at. And the reason is that the small amount of overhead that you need in order to realize that tweakable block cipher overlaps just fine with the uh, execution pipeline that's available uh, when, you're, um, uh, when the other half is occupied by AES operations. I would say one thing here that you know, our, um, our intuition about what would be fast wasn't always accurate. And it turned out to be really crucial to be implementing these modes as you were designing the algorithms. The way modern processors work is so complex, I think, that it's really hard to have a good intuitive model about what performance is going to be like for a low-level mode. Authenticated encryption has really been a highly successful endeavor. Um, at this point, I would say, that it has eclipsed conventional symmetric encryption modes, things like CBC mode or counter mode, to the point that it's understood if you're designing a new, um, uh, a new protocol or standard, 
that you should be looking towards authenticated encryption as your starting point. And I want to ask how it got to be as successful as this. And one answer I've already said is that, you know, it was the, the goodwill of people on standards committees who helped quickly import this to practice to solve an existing need. But at a more philosophical level, authenticated encryption succeeds because it makes demands on the user less. It makes it easier to use the primitive correctly. So as we go from conventional probabilistic encryption to that probabilistic notion of AE I gave at the beginning, to our not spaced authenticated encryption with associated data, in some sense, less and less is asked of the user of this mechanism. So ease of correct use should be increasing. The strength of the mechanism is effectively being increased, although formal comparisons may be difficult for the absence of a uh, unified syntax. Well, from this point of view, then, why do things have to stop at non-spaced AE, at AEAD? Maybe there's stronger notions still that would be useful. And there are. And let me describe the one called misuse-resistant authenticated encryption, sometimes going by the acronym MRAE. The goal here is to do as well as we can, even if nonces do get reused. Many people have expressed, and this came immediately after AEAD was, was described, that no matter what you say, nonces are going to be routinely repeated. They won't have the nonce property that I've demanded. Because our definitions tend to push us towards, I don't know, cutting towards the bone, trimming everything you don't need, schemes often fail quite spectacularly when you violate the underlying assumptions you've made. In fact, the schemes I've shown you so far, when you repeat a nonce, they do very badly. GCM completely fails, OCB completely fails. In a misuse-resistant authenticated encryption, repeating nonces, well, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's okay, it doesn't cause any problem in authenticity, and the only thing that's um, compromised in terms of privacy is what's necessarily compromised, that repetitions of NAM triples, nonce associated data and message, are necessarily made visible. The definition is hardly modified in order to capture this stronger notion of security. Before we demanded that nonces not repeat as the adversary makes the encryption queries, now all we demand is that NAM triples don't repeat. It's not hard to achieve message um, misuse resistant authenticated encryption. Here's a scheme that does it. We apply a pseudo random function f to the nonce, the associated data, and the message in order to create this uh, synthetic initialization value. And then we use it to key a quite conventional encryption scheme like counter mode in order to create the ciphertext. This pair is the ciphertext for this message. The paper that described this gave a sample instantiation, and I think in retrospect it was a poor example instantiation. For the encryption scheme, we used counter mode, and for the message authentication code, the pseudorandom function, we used what's called CMAC, which is a variant of the message authentication, um, uh, of the CBC message authentication code designed to ensure correct behavior across messages of varying lengths. The reason this is a poor choice is this guy. CMAC is inherently serial. You can't start working on the second block until you've finished working on the first block. And on modern processors, that causes an enormous degradation in performance, often a factor of more than five. So this inefficiency meant that this mode was actually much less you know, efficient than competing modes like GCM, and really quite unnecessarily, because one could have chosen an alternative message authentication code here that was parallelizable. And here is perhaps the nicest alternative instantiation of SIV at this point. This is the mode called AES GCM SIV. It was devised by Guerin, Langley, and Lindell, and, uh, and, um, uh, I believe was just recently made an RFC. Um, not only does this 
instantiate the message authentication code by something that's effectively parallelizable, something that looks rather like that um, repeated GF2 to the 128 multiply. But it employs several additional tricks so that the security theorem for AES GCM SIV is improved over that which we had before. In particular, the birthday bound attacks, which normally bring down most AE modes based on 128-bit block ciphers, are engineered out, and provably so. And there's a couple of tricks that are um, employed in order to effectively kill these birthday attacks when nonces are distinct. I won't have time to talk you through them, but I'll explain then that this is in some ways one of the principal games at this point, that we take our AEAD scheme and we use the provable security theorem as our guide in order to figure out just how well we're doing. Ideally, the best known attack and the provable security theorem are separated hardly at all, maybe a small constant, and at this point you can say you understand the security of the mechanism essentially perfectly. Furthermore, that point where they've met, the security bound and the, um, and the attack, you want, to, uh, um, you want to be a good point. Yes, all of these theorems are hiding the formulas that tell you how the adversary's resources go up or the adversary's success probability, its advantage goes down across the reduction. And these values can be used in a very concrete way to understand um, uh, how, how nice a scheme you have designed. I'd like to briefly talk about the Caesar competition. Um, uh, this was organized by Dan Bernstein, and I'm sure many of you uh, have been following it at some level. We've recently uh, announced the seven finalists. These are they, and I don't have time to talk through all of them. I'll briefly talk about these two. They're um, um, probably my two uh, favorite designs that emerged as finalists. This is the one called Aegis. Um, it was the second fastest of all the submissions and, um, uh, and really introduced a quite novel idea for achieving authenticated encryption. It employs these five 128-bit registers and with each basic step of the algorithm, we apply the AES permutation, that's what these red lines represent, followed by an XOR of what is at their endpoint. This is the basic operation that, you know, an Intel or a, actually ARM processors do it in the reverse order, are, are, are providing you. So the scheme is effectively designed starting with that which the hardware is giving us. And instead of going like through 10 rounds of AES, of, of, of these functions as AES would, we kind of mix up these five registers in a simple way using this, this AES permutation. We pull off some funky function of the value of those registers and we XOR it with the next piece of the input. In this way, a block of ciphertext comes out for every, what is this, five um, AES operations. So about, is that really five, two, three, four, five? So roughly twice the speed that you would expect um, of AES counter mode. This is really quite remarkable because we've taken um, a goal that's much harder than conventional symmetric encryption and we've used effectively the same tool, the same permutation that underlies AES, and yet we've achieved the harder goal with the same tool in half the time. And this has been pushed further, follow-up work called T-Ocean pulls off even more information uh, per AES permutation call and achieves even better speeds. This design is perhaps a bit more conservative. Unlike the other stuff I've shown you, at present, this kind of mechanism has no supporting proofs, which is certainly uh, uh, something that would, would nice, we, that would, uh, nice to be changed. This is the construction called uh, Deoxys 2. 
the um, it's the only misuse resistant authenticated encryption scheme to have made the, the, the final set of contestants from Caesar. It's based on a tweakable block cipher, and a construction of a, natable, of a native tweakable block cipher is provided. I've changed some small aspects of notation compared to the original description, but this should all be equivalent. So um, uh, this mode, just like the um, uh, AES GCM SIV mode, is designed in order to have good provable security bounds for the exact same goal for MRAE. In particular, as long as the nonces are distinct, we achieve, well, not only beyond birthday bound security, but almost linear degradation in the number of blocks used. It's a very interesting and well-constructed mode. Um, I'll mention this candidate, AEZ, that didn't make it to the final round. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting design for pushing the expectations even beyond MRAE. It targets a goal called robust authenticated encryption in which you're allowed to specify the amount of expansion you want for your plain text and the mode will guarantee you somehow the best security possible given that amount of expansion. In some ways, this notion bridges conventional authenticate, uh, bridges authenticated encryption with conventional block ciphers. When the expansion is zero, you actually have a block cipher, and our notion of security coincides with it being a strong pseudo-random permutation. As the expansion increases, you get something that looks very much like a misuse-resistant authenticated encryption scheme, but unlike those objects, we demand that you be able to apply this, well, wide block block cipher to messages of any size whatsoever, you know, from one bit to however many. So this is, a, um, this is not a conventional wide block block cipher. And we give a construction for this object. It is kind of complicated and, um, uh, and yet we've found that we're able to make these wide block or arbitrary block length block ciphers that are about as efficient as AES, even though they're accomplishing something that seems like it should take much more time. I'm going to wrap up and say that while I've somehow emphasized definitions in this talk, um, you know, I don't want to fetishize them either. The, the, the goal in cryptography is, of course, not to create definitions, but to somehow lead us toward systems that are more secure, more trusted, easier to correctly use, and used more ubiquitously. And I think authenticated encryption is a good tool towards aiding that transformation. And definitions are uh, and have proven to be a kind of essential piece of getting us there for AE and, in fact, for many other goals. In order to really get here, however, Definitions naturally need to be um, supplemented by good schemes, good proofs with nice bounds, standards that realize them, implementations that actually work, and systems that embody them and that deliver uh, the properties that the primitives uh, hope to actually be offering up. I'll end there. Any questions? Yes. Please. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, could you please uh, tell your opinion uh, about uh, uh, misuse resistant uh, AE? Uh, in uh, protocols, uh, actually, the problem of uh, providing distinct uh, nonces uh, uh, is solved uh, in the construction of the protocols. And uh, in some cases, and uh, also in the construction by Adam Langley, that you mentioned, uh, the ASGC, GCM SAV, which is now uh, going to be in ROC. Um, I think the construction makes uh, um, a little more complicated because of uh, resistance to nonce misuse. So what's your opinion about um, the future of AAD schemes without uh, nonce misuse resistance? Um, 
So if you're certain that the nonces will in fact be nonces, they're not going to repeat, then the guarantees we're adding in going from the AEAD notion to the MRAE notion are not worthwhile. They're not helping you in any way that I know. And therefore, opting for a simpler construction seems perfectly a perfectly reasonable choice. Um, misuse resistant authenticated encryption, in some sense, goes after two main customers. One is, is those that mess up. They tried to make a nonce, but they failed for some reason. And this seems to happen regularly. The second kind of customer is those where they really don't have access to something that behaves as a nonce. You know, if you start up a, uh, a wireless access point, apparently they have no persistent memory and they start up in the exact same state every time and there's just a real problem achieving something that behaves nonce-like on these devices. And, uh, you know, the people I know who work in system security point to other examples where it's just architecturally difficult in order to get a guaranteed nonce. Um, so, Misuse resistant authenticated encryption, the name is perhaps unfortunate because we're not trying to address all aspects of misuse, but just this very specific one of nonce reuse. And I think um, uh, there are other and still broader notions of misuse resistance that tackle um, aspects of misuse that go beyond or in a different direction than nonce reuse. Okay.